for exponential growth. We thank you for multiplication of lives, the 30% increase in every way, the 30% in growth, in, in personal growth, in the development of us as we follow you, Father. But then from that development, everything that you've called us to, it begins to increase supernaturally, and we thank you for it. Buddy, welcome to Noon Prayer. The title today, if you're taking notes, is Hit the Bull's Eye. I absolutely love to pray. You might have heard Pastor Greg mention it, um, and I don't remember exactly where, but um, in our home growing up, we um, my bedroom had two closets, and I converted one of them to the gap. That's what we called it because the Bible says that we should stand in the gap. We should pray. So I took all the clothes out of it. I put a little desk in there. I put my Bible in there. Y'all, I had my prayer list, all the celebrities, like everybody that was on any television show that I liked that I didn't want to go to hell. You know, I had like a long list of all these things. And I think I had taken a prayer class that we had at church, probably taught by Miss Vonnie in my early middle school years and, you know, even into high school. So then when we moved into another home, um, our garage had this shop. Well, Pastor Dean didn't need a shop. Like, what was he going to do in there? Like, he didn't have any tools. We didn't need any of that. So we ripped out all of the shelves and, you know, all the things that you need for, like, your your workbench or whatever. We ripped all that out. We painted it. We put carpet in it. We put all of our Carmen posters up or my Carmen posters up. And, and basically, that was called The Gap. That was our prayer room. And And so I'm just super excited about the privilege of um, coming together with you, whether you're in the room or you're with us online, to pray together. You know, it's important, and it's such a gift uh, for us to have the person of the Holy Spirit. So I want to write down a couple of things, or have you write down a couple things, just as it pertains to prayer in our relationship with the Holy Ghost. Because this is obviously one of the things that, um, you know, the enemy wants to squelch out and wants to um, uh, cease revelation of in this hour, and not just in the world at large, but in the church. Um, This would be one of the three things that the who, um, you know, does not like because it strips people of supernatural power. You are not a soul and you are not a body. You are a spirit. And so it's important that we understand how to relate to the Holy Spirit. He's our helper. And in uh, one of the greatest things that he does is helps us pray. You don't know the future. I mean, he helps us a lot in life, but but one of the things he helps us do is pray because prayer literally unlocks, you can write it down, John 14, 26, mysteries. Like you, you want to know things to come. You want to be able to see the things that you can't see. And so the enemy would love to convince you that you're more productive reading, you're more productive working, you're more productive studying, and all those things are great. You need to work, you need to study, uh, you need to read, you need to do those things. But when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you supernaturally access the mind of the spirit and you unlock mysteries. And then in Romans 8, 26, the Bible says when it, when it says that the Holy spirit is our helper and he prays through us with groanings that cannot be uttered, um, that that word help and just write this phrase. And this is not on the screen. I didn't give it to them. That word that he helps us in our infirmities and, and infirmities isn't just sickness. Like it's any weakness that phrase or that word help. It actually, means in the Greek, he takes hold together. He takes hold together with against. He takes hold together with against. So we have something heavy in front of us. We have our purpose. We have our family. We have our nation, we have our finances, we have our health. So think about one individual trying to move a heavy grand piano, right? They're not going to be able to do that by themselves. But the Holy Spirit comes alongside of them and takes a hold of that piano with them against what? Against the weight of it. He takes hold together with against. Now, in the time that we've set aside, there are certain things that our pastor, like every single day, you see us rotate five primary things that are important. They're important for the health of the church, and they're important for the health of the believer and the perpetuation of the kingdom. But then we also take a few minutes and we pray for our nation. Why do we do that? Well, because number one, the Bible says to, and write this um, 
these verses down and you guys are familiar with them. So when we go, we'll just go. We'll, we'll jump into our prayer topic. And then uh, when we pray, we'll also pray for um, America. Number one, why do we pray for America or the, these leaders? Because the Bible says to, in First Timothy 2, 1 and 2, um, the message says, the first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how for everyone you know. So there is a place to p- pray in our understanding, right? And there's, because we're, we're confessing, we're making declarations, we're, we're doing as Mark eleven twenty three 23 through 24 says, we're speaking to the mountain. We're calling those things. You can't think prayers. You have to say it. You have to say it. So we pray in the natural and then we pray in the spirit because he told us to pray, especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so that we can be quietly about our business. I don't want people bugging. I don't want people bugging. I don't want people bugging my business, bugging my freedoms, right? Second Thessalonians three, One and two also says, why do we pray for our leaders? Because the Bible says to. One more thing, pray for us. Pray that the master's word will simply take off and race through the country. Why do we pray for pastors and spiritual leaders in all those states? What difference does it make? They should do their own praying. Because the Bible says to. The Bible says to. And because we're not selfish. I want people praying for me. So I'm going to pray for other. You're going to reap what you sow, right? We want people praying for our pastor. Well, why do we pray for all hidden things to be exposed, revealed, and removed? Because that's our covenant right. Luke 8, 17 says, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed. That's a promise for me that I don't have to go around caught off guard all the time. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. I can't believe that happened. I can know. I can have confidence. He can show me things to come. That's why I pray. And number two, why do I pray? Or, or, uh, why, what, what else does the Bible say? Ezekiel thirty three eleven. He doesn't want even the wicked to perish, right? That's why when you pray, just shut your mouth. Just shut your mouth. You don't know people. Now, there are many of these leaders that potentially have already given themselves over to a reprobate mind. They want to go to hell. They're excited to go to hell. They have given themselves over to complete wickedness, but we don't know that. We don't know that. And at the end of the day, let's be honest, we don't care that much. We don't care. We just want to pray. Right. We just I'm not in the business of daily determining who is totally wicked and who still has a chance. I don't have time for that. So I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray for all of them, regardless of of how their ex feed is or what they're doing on CNN or elsewhere. Okay, so the Bible says to. And then number two, why do we pray for our leaders? Why do we set this time aside? I have skin in the game. I have a vote. I'm a citizen. And I have seed. I pay my taxes. Right. So I have skin in the game. So as long as I have skin in the game, I have a spiritual right. I have spiritual authority in this county. I have spiritual authority in this state. And I have spiritual authority in this nation. If we don't take it as the church, then that's how things get lost. And they literally get lost, get lost by, by such a weak opponent. Think about the legislation that has been perpetuated in our nation. And it's not been by a large group of people. In many cases, it's been by a handful of individuals, many of which were paid to advance somebody else's agenda. So basically, this is not hard. The enemy has already been defeated. But if we neglect to take our place, if we neglect to claim our space in the spirit, then the enemy roams about and he has access. I don't want to, I'm going to come off. I'm going to come off because here's the thing at the end. And let me just talk a little bit more about prayer in the end. We're going to be held responsible. I like um, what brother Hagen received in a vision from the Lord. And this is a long time ago, but I won't be this church. Say I won't be this church. At the final service, Brother Hagen writes, of our camp meeting in 1979, some of the speakers and others went up to Ken Jr.'s hotel for sandwiches. As we were talking about the things of God, the Spirit of God kept moving on me. Actually, only three times in my life has the Spirit moved on me in such a measure. I said to the others, let's pray. The Spirit of God keeps moving on me. We prayed. By the Spirit, I ministered to each one present, and then I was caught up in the Spirit of prayer and intercession. For lack of a better term, I was lost in the Spirit. I was not unconscious, but I was more more conscious of spiritual things. Now, here's what you need to know. In relationship with the Holy Spirit, write this down and it's not on the screen. Number one, there's a place for just your edification. That's John 14, 4. So we're going to leave here today after this hour that we've set aside and prayer in the Holy Ghost still needs to be a part of your life because it'll build you up. Well, what am I built up for? You're built up in your purpose. You're built up in the knowledge of who you got to know who he is on the inside of you. 
You got to know if he's a teacher on the inside of you. You got to know if he's a business owner or an entrepreneur on the inside of you. You've got to know if he's a five-fold ministry gift on the inside of you. You've got to know as a minister of help, which we're all called to the ministry of help, that you've got an assignment in your church and you've got to be built up in that. You know, the other day I walked through the youth room and, and um, you know, Miss Leanne, who helps us with our, our youth praise and worship team, you know, she's got all these teenagers, she's trying to wrangle. You got to be built up on the Holy Ghost to do that. Sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes they can't sing. Sometimes they're late for practice. You, you got to be, that's a ministry of helps, but that's significant. You got to be built up in that. You cannot do a spiritual job in the natural. We're spirits. We're not called to conduct ourselves in the natural and after this natural order. And so there is a place in intercession where you're building yourself up, John 14, 4 or Jude 20. But that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is intercession. We're praying out mysteries or we're making great power available to other people. So that's what's happening as Brother Higgins just hanging out, eating sandwiches with a bunch of other Christian leaders. All of a sudden something snaps and he's like, we need to pray. I sat with my eyes shut, praying in tongues for what proved to be several hours. When it was all over, I opened my eyes. It was after 4 a.m. Yet it seemed as if I'd only been praying for 10 or 15 minutes. And you might ask, well, why do we only pray? We have noon prayer for an hour, but we only pray for about 20 minutes. Well, because number one, it's 2024. Okay, you guys know what year it is? And so we're working to, to develop spiritual endurance in people. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, you need to get to a place where you can pray in the Holy Ghost for longer than 10 minutes. But we teach because there's no point in coming in here and everyone just sitting down and praying in their prayer language with no focus, with no direction. So we teach so that you understand and then you recognize that 20 minutes times however many people are live, however many people are watching, and however many people rewatch, how much power was really made available. Okay. And then we go on about our business. Now, again, if you're only praying is this 20 minutes every day, you're probably not going to be very strong in what you're called to do. Right. So you want to move past that, but we've set aside this time because that's what they did in the, in the early church. They met together in the temple and they prayed together and then from house to house. So that's why we do that. Okay. So they prayed what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes, but was basically until 4 a.m. So imagine the church service went to about 10 or 11, you know, like a big one, a good one. And they prayed until 4 a.m., right? The Lord spoke to me, among other things. He gave me instructions concerning the prayer and healing school. John 14, 26, you pray out mysteries, right? That's how you move into your next steps. If you just keep on doing what you're doing, the Holy Spirit is under no obligation to instruct you in something that you're not hungry for. So you can just keep doing what you're doing. Or you can pray and say, Father, and I pray this every single morning, Father, uncover and expose our next steps for Choose Life Church and Dean Shopshire Ministries. For Pastor Greg and I, for Pastor Faith, show us the next steps. And sometimes it's just a little thing that you do next, but guys, you're only moving in steps. It's not going to be this big thing, but it would just be one little thing that would move you forward. He loves you. He's not trying to drag you along into his plan. He just wants you to move one step at a time from faith to faith and from glory to glory, whether you're in the ministry or you're in the marketplace. So he had ministered to the Lord and he gave him these instructions, excuse me. He said, then I saw something. I saw three things coming out of the Atlantic Ocean. So then he has a vision. They looked like three giant black frogs as large as whales. One was midair. The other two had just stuck their heads up out of the water. Now, water is a type of like a sea of people. It's not actual water. Okay, so he knew that. And so he said... You saw the same thing in 1970. This is nine years later. I told you then exactly what they were, but you didn't do what you should have done about it. I told you back in 1970 to pray for the leaders of the nation. What happened? Watergate, so forth. It's not all the fault of the men who, or the man who was then president. I'm going to hold the Christians of the nation responsible. You may want to write that down. I'm responsible. You've got seed in the game. Okay, he gave the earth to us. He gave it to us. Well, I don't want to be bothered by that. And listen, my success as a believer is not tied to the success of America. I'm not saying that. But I'm not going to be spiritually irresponsible either. Right? And so he said, I'm going to hold the church responsible. You are the ones who allowed what happened to your nation. If you had prayed, 
it never would have happened. I showed you what, what was about to happen. Go back and check. Back in 1970, you saw three similar dark objects come out of the Atlantic Ocean and leapfrog all the way across the land. If you and the Christians had done what you should have done, none of those things would have happened to your nation. You would have not had the riots. You would have not had the political disturbances. Your president would have not made the mistakes he made. In fact, I'm holding the church responsible. So our prayer is so important as it pertains to this time and this hour. Now, we're not praying against end time events. They're going to come. But we don't want to see people lost. We don't want to people. We don't want to see people deceived. We don't want to see the advancement of the kingdom hindered in any way. We don't want to be bothered. We don't want to be bothered. We don't want to, We want to be able to say what we need to say. We want to be able to pray in the Holy Ghost. We want to be able to preach prosperity. We want to be able to lay hands on. The, we don't want to be bothered. And that's up to us. We had a nation that was developed with the promise of these freedoms. Let's not turn it over at the end because we're like, well, he's coming back soon, anyways. This thing's wrapping up. It is wrapping up, but you don't know when it's wrapping. Up. And even if it's three years or five years or 30 minutes, I don't want to be bugged. I don't want to be bugged. Like, I don't want to be bothered. So if I can just surrender some moments of my life to pray and do it in faith, you have to do it in faith. Everything you do, you do in faith. And I do according to the word of God, then it's going to be better. I can go about my business quietly and not have to be bothered. Right. And I think I did give them that statement. So you can write it down. My success isn't tied to the success of, the, of America. My success is tied to the victory of, of the resurrection. But the land can prosper because of me. The land can prosper because of me. This region can prosper because of me. Wherever you're praying from, your region can prosper because of you. If it happened under an old covenant, how much more under a new covenant? In Genesis 41, when Joseph was in charge of the entire country of Egypt, what happened? It prospered. When a, a foreigner... A Hebrew came into the Egyptian land with the blessing, with the anointing, under an old covenant. You need to understand what you carry. You need to understand the power that you carry. And these things are revealed to you as you give yourself to the Spirit. If you just drive around walking after the flesh, looking at the natural, doing your laundry, do all these things. They're important. But if you're more naturally minded than you are spiritually minded, you don't take your place. You don't take your authority. Joseph goes into this nation. He knows who his God is. He honors his God. And what happens? Jo Pharaoh told Joseph, I'm Pharaoh, but no one in Egypt will make a single move without your stamp of approval. There is a place that we can advance in when it comes to our nation, when it comes to school boards, when it comes to, to we can take a place, but you're going to receive those instructions and those steps by the spirit. You can, well, you know, people are going to choose and they're choosing death and there's nothing we can do. And people have said that. I don't know why anybody would want to be in government. Government. I don't know why anybody would want to be a president. Well, if we're going to say that, we might as well just throw in, I don't know why anybody would want to be a pastor. I don't know why anybody would want to be a dentist. Can you imagine being a dentist? Can you imagine being a dentist and looking at people's mouths all day? I got some people dogging me right now, y'all. They're coming for my mouth. They want to know the bacteria. They want to do a saliva sample. They did a whole head scan. They're like trying to see if my nose is straight. I'm like, they're coming for me. And I'm like, this is your job, yo. This, I got to get out of here. I did. I said, I got to get out of this office. This is too much. T turn the screen. I don't need to see those pictures. You got this build up here and here. I listen, I don't need all this. Okay. I came here for you to do a job. You don't need to tell me what you're doing. You just need to do your job. You know what I'm saying? But if we're going to say that, who would want to be a dentist? Who would want to be a teacher? Who, why are we even here? Let's all just go hide in a, a ditch somewhere. I mean, if it's all that bad, you know, why should you be in, in government? Because you're good at it and you're a believer and you're, you know, I mean, pastor Greg, if he wasn't called to the ministry, he's like a little governor. He, I mean, he'll go anywhere, talk to everybody. I'm like, shut your mouth, yo. No one need, who are you, are you like uh, campaigning? You would be, people enjoy my conversation. No, they don't. No one's trying to talk in the elevator. You know, some people are gifted in that way. They're influential. They're, they can move people, right? Why should you be anywhere? Because God's called you there. Right? And so jo Joseph is there. Pharaoh gave Joseph an Egyptian name. He gave him a place. He took over his duties. Literally, the Pharaoh handed his responsibilities to Joseph under an old covenant. So you can't just be like, well, we're just going to hold on until he comes back. Well, that's fine. Like, please hold on. Like, don't lose your salvation and go back to the world. But don't have that mentality. Like, if we're going to be here, let's dominate. 
Like, let's dominate. Let's take our place. We were made for that. So um, Joseph took over all the duties. He was 30 years old when he went to work for Pharaoh. And then in verse 47 of Genesis 41, during the next seven years of plenty, the land produced bumper crops. Joseph gathered up the foods from the seven good years in Egypt. He stored the food. God gave him strategy. To, do you want people hurting? Like there's certain legislation that when it's passed, it hurts people. It hurts people for them to, to have marijuana legally accessible to them. That hurts people. And then it hurts people when those stores are opened. Well, do you know some people have real estate that don't allow those stores to be in their shopping centers and other people do. Right? So let's pray that we will own the shopping centers. You will own the shopping centers. Right? Because you, you don't have to change everything, but you could change what you own. You understand what I'm saying? Like you could do your part instead of just sitting back. Well, I don't know why anybody would want to do that. Again, like where's a hole? Let's all jump in. Let's all jump in the hole with the dried food if that's where we're going to go. You know, like who wants to live like that? It's just so negative. When in the spirit, you can just say, okay, God, I'm a spirit and I'm just one. But if God be for me and if one can put a thousand to flight, Lord, I want my thousand. I want my thousand. And then I go to church with other people. And two can put 10,000. We want our tens of thousands. Like, I want my thousand. So just show me where they're at in the spirit. And again, you're not, we don't have pickets. You know, we have a little billboard, which they're all over the state of New Mexico. It's, it's very kind. It's very pleasant. It just, hey, hit us up when this doesn't get it done. That's it. You know, we're not judging them. We're not, you smell like skunk. You know, we're not, we're not doing that, but we just, we just, Hey, here's a little, here's a little message. And other people may, they may have a little bit harsher. I'm listen, y'all. I, I, I'm kind of Jekyll and Hyde with that, like a, a boldness under the anointing, but just out in the street, my name's charity. You cannot expect for me to just be going crazy on people. It's not going to happen. So let's just a very kind billboard that says, Hey, hit us up, you know, just so people have a seed. That when they get tired of smelling like skunk and like moving slow, they can realize that there's more to life. Amen. And there's no real success for their depression or whatever it is they're facing in just muting their whole world with that. Right. So with that being said, I want my thousand. And in the, in the spirit, he'll show you just what to do. I'm not trying to change everything, but I'm going to change the space I'm supposed to change. I'm going to change the space I'm supposed to change. You know, I told somebody recently um, in 2019, we were um, early, early months of 2019, we were praying as a staff. We hadn't obviously opened it up in this way. And, um, and two major things came up in my heart in our prayer. And it was for China and it was for marriages in our church. And it was like, that is so, what, what are we praying for China for? We don't have any missionaries in China. Y'all, I'll be honest. My aunt went to China when I was in middle school. Okay. And she smuggled Bibles and we never heard the end of it. And I I mean, she's dead. So I can't, I don't think you can't come for her. I didn't go like, but she smuggled the Bibles and it hurt her back. She had a back injury, I think for the rest of her life, if we're being honest, like I can't even really get into that. But anyway, she comes back and she's all like, whatever. She gives me this book and I love to read called China cry. The, if you've read the book, it's so traumatizing. I'm like, I don't want to read the book. I don't have a heart for missions. I don't have a heart for China. I mean, I'll send the money to China. I'll pray for who's ever in China. But I personally, and I'm just like, like, I'm just saying she smuggled the Bible. She went to China. It was a whole thing. But I'm like, so when the Holy Spirit tells me to pray for China, that's literally my only point of reference. I'm like, this is so weird. I don't know any missionaries in China, like who's in China, whatever. But now looking back, like there's a very good chance. And again, I'm thinking there's probably 20 of us that were praying consistently for several months. Y'all that COVID-19 thing is called COVID-19. But it didn't come out till 2020. Now, am I saying that our church and me specifically single-handedly heard God to pray against that? No. Not only no, but like absolutely no. But I do know that we had a part. Right? And to be honest, um, in, in praying for marriages, there were other things that were exposed that we moved forward in. But, but And maybe we could have gone back and maybe not let go of that. Because we did. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like he wants to help you. Now, again, I'm not saying that we were the cause or we were the, the restrainer, but I am saying like, you need to be more spiritually minded than you are natural minded. And you need to realize if you pay federal taxes, if you pay state and local taxes, you have a voice. The church can't just sit back, r- wrote religious praying over just their kids and their food and their little futures and pleading the blood. And it's just, there's a bigger world out there. 
There's a bigger world that you can influence. And so Joseph did that obviously under an old covenant. And then in second Chronicles seven fourteen, you guys know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now, as much as can be done through our faith and our commitment, we want to do it. We want to do it. Listen, I'm not trying to change everybody. People still have a free will, but what I can do, I'm going to do. And we're going to do collectively here as Choose Life, as Dean Shopster Ministries, and whoever else joins us. So you have to understand the context of that. And in praying out mysteries, you know, as we pray over the nation for things to be revealed, and then we continue to pray for the next steps as a, a body of believers, you know, it's important that there's always peace and there's always joy. When you meet resistance, and, and even within yourself, when you're bogged down, when you're feeling frustrated, when you're feeling dry, you shouldn't feel dry as a believer. You have resurrection power on the inside of you. So you just need to tap in. You need to tap in through prayer in the Holy Ghost. But that's one of the alarms, so to speak, that goes off on the inside of you when there's a lack of peace, when there's a lack of joy, there's a lack of clarity, there's a lack of specific revelation, and maybe it's in the written word, or maybe it's the specific things for your next step. You know, I tell this story a lot, but when I was in Bible school, I came home from work um, really late. My, my shift was 1 to 10, one thirty to 10. And so I was about 20 minutes away from my duplex. So by the time I got home, it's about 1020. And I see one of my friends who was also, you know, a neighbor. She didn't live, but a couple streets over kind of curled up on my front porch, you know, which is like a little bit awkward. It's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you curled up on my front porch? And she was sad. And so I, I'm like, hey, like, what's going on? And she's like, basically, she'd been in this relationship, and um, this guy had proposed to her. And I, I all, um, had always thought he was a little bit squeaky, um, greasy. You know what I mean by that? Like, a little too slick. So I like to say greasy. God bless him wherever he is right now. I pray he's in the will of God. But at the time, I was kind of like, a little, he's a little greasy for me. And so I shared that with her, like he's a little greasy for me. She, he had asked her to marry him. He had asked her to marry him. She said no. She didn't feel peace about it. She went home for a summer, came back. You know, they start kind of casually dating again. He asked again. She's like, I just, I don't feel right about it. And I said, well, let's just pray in the Holy Ghost. So we went inside my duplex and my roommate's already asleep, but I got my little CD player. It's like, <laughs> anyway, so you get the CD player, you put in the CD, and we put on the worship song. And 45 minutes later, because there's a truth here, until there's peace, right? Now, when we're in here, we're going to pray for an hour, that's it right? That we've allotted that time. But in your own personal life, you pray like the old time Pentecostals would say they prayed it through, right? You pray like, you, you know, something doesn't seem right with your kids. Something doesn't seem right with your business. You, you're lacking peace in an area. Well, what are you going to do? Are you just going to keep gritting it out and confessing the word? Nothing wrong with that. But the Holy Spirit could show you something that would unlock, like you need the keys. Yes, we build on the word of God, but if it was only the word of God, then why would he have given us the helper? You don't just have the word. You need the key, the specific thing to unlock. You know, as a youth ministry, you know, several months ago, we were in conference and I was praying and I'm putting my responsibilities and what I've been entrusted to in this ministry before the Lord. And I'm saying, Lord, show me the next steps. And we're praying and we're surrendered and we're under that, that, that presence of the anointing. And he shows me, this is the next step. Like get your leaders to do this, this, this X, Y, and Z and something breaks. Right? Because we're not just going to stand here and call in the people. Okay? That's important. Like, we believe. We, we call the people in. Yes. Ministering spirits go. Move on their heart. That's great. If you're pastors, you don't neglect that. Right? We have people, and you guys have heard from her, if you, if you join us on a regular basis, and we can put the picture up of um, me and our family and Jaslyn. Put up Jaslyn. Jaslyn's family's been here for I don't know how many years, and she's led prayer. This was at her graduation from our homeschool co-op. Jaslyn's family was not ever invited to church. They literally found us in the Yellow Pages. God bless the Yellow Pages. And you know, I absolutely love that because I remember intentionally receiving our, our bill for our ad in the Yellow Pages, right? And we wanted, we paid for a little bit bigger one. So our church would stand, meaning we're going to do our part. And as ministry leaders, you need to do that for your churches. Like do your part, 
right? But at the same time, like nobody ever invited them. They just, they came from the yellow pages, right? We had a, a, a billboard years ago, and you can put the picture of the guy up. We don't have the billboard. Um, so this billboard, and y'all, everybody thought that guy went to our church. So they would come. We'd be like, oh, he's not here this week. Y'all, he didn't come to our church. It was a graphic. It was a stock photo. You know what I mean? But as long as you think he's, kind of, he's here, how, whatever it takes for you to get here. Now, we didn't just have his picture. We had his picture and, like, our times and there's more, whatever. But, y'all, I'm telling you, that guy's face, whoever he is, like, he grew the church, like, for a minute. You know what I mean? Um, because they would see that and think that guy came here. Well, Laura, which you guys don't see her leading prayer, but she's on our staff. Laura saw that billboard. Nobody invited Laura to this church. She was not from here. She was from New York, literally. New York moved to New Mexico, Hobbs, New Mexico. She didn't know anybody, right? Nobody invited her. Nobody spoke to her. She went to Hobbs High School. Nobody invited her. She went to colleges. She was a waitress. She was here for years before she came to this church, but she saw that billboard. Ministry leaders, you do your part. You do everything that you can do in the natural. But ultimately, like we don't want to just go that if that billboard only got Laura, right? The spirit of God directed us, get the billboard. The spirit of God directs you. Hey, get a little bit of a bigger ad in the yellow pages, right? Let your church show up just a little bit more prominently, right? You're going to get the keys in the spirit, right? He'll show you the thing. So we're praying, me and my friend, in about 45 minutes, something breaks and she had peace. She wasn't crying and we just felt that heaviness lift, And within one week, it all came out. The guy that she was supposedly supposed to get married to, that was a little bit greasy. He had a whole other thing going. He had a little mistress and he had another little girlfriend. So he would drop her off and say, you know, I'm going to go read my Bible. And he wasn't going to go read his Bible. He had that little girl at his apartment and he was doing something different all night. Okay. But he wasn't having a Bible study. You know what I'm saying? And it all came out. And it was like this beautiful thing where she talked to her, which is always classic. I wish we had cell phones back then that had cameras, but we did not Um, because it would have been a beautiful video where, you know, he walks in and they're both sitting there. What are you going to do? You know what I mean? It was beautiful how it had, how it completely unfolded. Well, we prayed that out, right? Much better to find that out on that side of things than after, you, you know what I mean? So you can't do life naturally. You have to be spiritual about things. So you're going to do these things in your own life and you're going to believe for the next steps. And they may seem so insignificant, but it will unlock things. You know why? Because this isn't supposed to be hard. God doesn't want, like your next step isn't going to be this toilsome thing. It's going to be like a little thing that just will unlock it. And it's in every single realm, but you have to choose to position yourself and surrender to the helper. And you don't surrender to the helper just with the word. You start in the word. That's why we're giving you all these scriptures. But then you pray in the Holy Ghost and then you listen. And so today... I told you the title is Hit the Bullseye. So we're talking about our relationship with the lost. 2 Peter 3.9, or our personal contacts, as our pastor says, 2 Peter 3.9, God does not desire that any perish or any be lost, right? In Matthew 9.37 through 38, the Bible does not ever say to pray for the lost. You don't pray for the lost. You can pray that people's eyes are open. You can commission ministering spirits to go. But the Bible doesn't say to pray for the lost. The Bible says to pray for the workers, right? Jesus made a circuit of all the towns in Matthew 9, 37 through 38. He taught in their meeting places. He reported kingdom news. He healed their diseased bodies. He healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked over the crowds, his heart was broken. This is the message. His heart wasn't broken, but he was moved with compassion. Um, they were confused and aimless. That's why I like this message paraphrase. They were confused and aimless sheep with no shepherds. What a huge harvest and how few workers on your knees and pray for the lost. No, on your knees and pray for the workers. We are all called, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, to go into the world and train everyone you meet, right? Not just make converts, but train them up. Train everyone you meet far and near, making them by baptism in threefold, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Instruct them, instruct them, which means you got to teach them in the practice of all I've commanded you. John 9, 4, Jesus said, we need to be energetically at work energetically at work for the one who sent me here working while the sun shines because the time is coming when the work day is going to be over. 
It's going to wrap up and we don't get to work anymore. So we have to do our work. We have to hit the bullseye from his perspective. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, well, in, in the end of John 9, 4, Jesus says that he's the light, but then he commissions us as the light. In Matthew 5, 14, here's the way to put it. You're here to be the light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be opening By opening up to others, you prompt people to open up with God, this generous father in heaven. And so it's important that we realize we have a responsibility. And I'm going to give you three places in our contacts. Number one, out of church. You have a responsibility to people outside of the church. And I want to show you this graphic because it'll help you focus your efforts and your influence. And um, John Maxwell uses this a lot because oftentimes what we do, um, and you can illustrate it by bullseye. I don't know if you guys like playing darts. I've always liked playing darts. Um, but go to the next slide and you can maybe draw one on your, on your notes. But, but that middle circle representing the bullseye is where we focus. Those are the people that you actually know, that you come in contact with, that you can actually influence. Where people spend most of their time in conversation and whatever is with these outside circles. Let's say that outside black circle would represent, um, you know, the president of Turkey. Well, I don't know him. You know what I mean? Like, who's ever in charge of Hamas? Or whoever's in charge of the World Health Organization? Or whoever, you know, Nancy Pelosi. You know, she's everyone's problem. She's not my problem. Right? You, the further out you get, the more distant you are in influence, but yet that's where people spend most of their time in conversation, right? Okay, problems in Brazil. I'm not in Brazil. I'm not in Brazil. I'm not called to Brazil, right? I, I, I don't know anybody that, do you understand what I'm saying? And you focus on these things instead of realizing and getting, oh, you get overwhelmed. Like, no, my focus is the people that I actually know. And you can write this statement down on the next slide. Um, the, fa- the further, should it be further? F-U-R, farther, further, further with the U. Okay, the earlier this is in the morning, the, the more uh, assistance we need with the grammar. The further... And I don't mean right now, although this is like a little bit earlier than I like to be flowing, but it's fine. The further outside of the bullseye, more prayer, less personal, but you can't just pray, right? You can't just, yes, we're going to pray for all these other people, but what about the people that you actually know? Especially because it's like Easter Sunday. It's coming up. We have a responsibility. The people that you actually know. So what should you do outside of church? Well, number one get your head in the game. You have to surrender. You have to get up every single day and say, according to Luke twenty two forty two, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Bring people across my path. Father, I choose to be bold. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. The message says that honest people are relaxed and confident. So I'm not overwhelmed. You know, I'm not like trying to get a certain soul count every day and it's all riding on me. Every, you know, I got to win. Every, I got to win the loss. The whole world is, no, everybody in high school, I don't. I just have to hit my bullseye, right? So you start with surrender. You get your head in the game first thing in the morning. Number two, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You pray in the Holy Ghost. You realize I have power. Father, when I open my mouth, you're going to fill it. I just don't know what to say. He'll give you the words to say, right? There'll be a flow. Pray in the Holy Ghost and there'll be a flow. You got to get filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, even if you're watching us online, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Like hit us up. We'll send you information about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Number three, you have to smile and look at people, (laughs) right? We have to say this in the world that we live in because people are always looking at their phone, right? We don't make eye contact, and y'all, sometimes I can be like this. Thank, thank goodness I'm married to a politician minister. Pastor Greg, you know, he's talking to everybody, meeting everybody. They enjoy me. I'm like, no one enjoys you. You know, that's the whole point of getting an Uber. We don't have to talk to them. They already know where we're going. You plugged it in. They know. No need to talk, right? We do not need to talk to Muhammad right now. We do not, okay? Like, it's not, it's not a thing. But 
So I have to challenge myself in this, not to smile because I like to smile and, and I don't even mind looking at people, but we don't need to speak. We don't need to exchange. We don't need to speak. We don't need to exchange any conversation. Like just, just be moved by my joy. Now, if you speak to me, I'm happy. Let's go. But I'm not, I'm not one that normally generates the communication. You know what I'm saying? Pastor Greg, he's like, are you, do you want to work here? Like, you know how they used to have the elevator people that were do you want to, do you want to be that? Do you want a job? Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked him hard in the eye and he loved him. You need to look at people in the face. Okay. Outside of church, you need to make eye contact with your waiter, with your waitress. You need to make eye contact with the people that are bagging your groceries. You need to make eye contact. You need to smile. You need to fix your face. You need to practice how you look, right? Cause we say it all the time. We look at you in church. If you look out there, like you look in church, nobody's getting saved. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. Because you don't look happy. So if you, now, if you're only unhappy in here, what's your actual problem? You should be happy in church. This is your church. You should be happy in here. But if you look out there, like you look in here, nobody wants your Jesus. Right. And then number four, you have to listen for connections in conversation. People will say stuff. Oh, I'm just so worried about my kids. That's your end. You didn't even have to say anything. People will just talk to you. People, people don't, nobody talks to me. Exactly. And, and listen, nobody at church wants to talk to you either. So that's a problem. If your brothers and sisters in Christ don't even want to talk to you, why would people outside want to talk to you when people in the church are actually commanded to talk to you and they still don't want to talk to you. Right? So do have a presence, right? And then people will just open up to you. It's like, I don't know why they open up to me. One of our teenagers, she's in here right now. People always open up to her. She's so pleasant. She just has a demeanor of like, I'll be your friend. Like if there was a song that said, I will be your friend, it would be her face. Like, right? So people open up to her, right? Well, that's your end. I'm just so depressed. My parents are getting a divorce. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids. We never have enough money. That's your end. You have the answer. You should always be prepared to give an answer. When Jesus, and you can just write down the reference in John chapter four, Jesus engaged the woman at the well. He engaged the Samaritan woman. Right? See, again, I have to challenge myself in that. Like, ask for the water, we're done. He keeps going. He starts with all these little medallies and these little poems. Like, uh, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. That's like, Pastor Dean, no, we're not doing any of that. Just give me the water. And then he goes even deeper. Like, you bring your husband, and she doesn't have a husband. Oh, Lord. Like, now we just open a can of worms. No, we're not trying to do any of that. We're just trying to get the water. We're just trying to get what we need to get, right? But no, that's not, that's not who he is on the inside of us. So I have to challenge myself, you know, because sometimes you want to say, well, bless the Lord. You know, there, you can come to church with me. Well, sometimes that'll work, but then other times you need to linger. You need to listen. You need to make that connection. Okay. Now in the church, this is important. This is important. You have a responsibility. You need to make contact in a world that is so digital and it's all about, you know, following and all this stuff, you know, and we, we do these things because we're preparing for, you know, the apocalypse on YouTube where everything's censored. So we move over to X because we know it's not going to be censored. But please understand that, that, that those kinds of things are great, but you don't just use that. Right? There have to be personal connections outside of the church and inside the church. And I want you to see how easy it is. You have a responsibility in the church to people. It's not just the pastor's job because what did Matthew twenty eight twenty say? Train them up. Don't just get them saved. They need to be trained up. Well, that takes relationship. So in church, in order to be effective and to hit the bullseye, you got to come early. You got to stay late. You got to kind of mingle. You got to kind of mingle. You got to come a little bit early. You got to stay late, right? You can't get there when everybody's already in worship. You're running in. You didn't get to mingle. You didn't get to talk to anybody before. You know, when Pastor Greg and I first moved to Hobbs after Bible school, we didn't, I was a, I was a secretary. Like, let's be honest, I was the church secretary. I think, and in many cases, I still am the church secretary. I'm an administrator. That's, that's one of my gifts. That's what I do. I didn't have a pastoral role. Pastor Greg didn't even work here. But when we saw new people in church, we made it our mission. Y'all, Pacific Rim was our spot, a local restaurant here. And we would always take them to Pacific Rim. That was our place. We would take new people. We would take, you know, single people. We would take married people. We made it our mission when people came and now it's like, you don't even, I, I, I'm like, y'all don't have friends. Y'all don't talk to people. I didn't have anything in common with those people. Greg didn't have anything in common with those people. I'm raised in church. I have like zero point of reference for your life, for your background. Let's be honest. They're all Mexican. I'm not Mexican. Greg is surely not Mexican. 
Now, he likes the Mexican food. But he's not mad. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't like I was hunting and scanning the crowd for people that were like me. Who, who was like me? My sister, my mom, my dad? No. I was scanning the crowd for new faces, for people that I was like, I think I could kind of like hang in a conversation with them for one meal. You know what I'm saying? Number two, you have to talk to people. And not the same people. Like, not your friends at church. You have to talk to other people. How are people going to grow? How are people going to going to be connected? That's not, the, but the pastor can't connect everybody in your church. You have to create a culture like this. And number three, you have to serve. You have to serve because as you're serving, you're going to start hearing people's stories. You'll hear them in the bookstore. You'll see them in the cafe. You'll start to develop. It gives you an, uh, an open door of influence in their life beyond what may happen before service or in between services. You, you guys know Pastor Greg. I mean, he would be lingering and talking to people. Yo, he would be talking to people forever. Right? Meeting them. Hey, we, I invited so-and-so to lunch. And I'm like, I don't want to go to lunch with so-and-so. You know what I'm saying? But I learned how important that, and then honestly, how easy it is and how rewarding it is and how fun it is. Now, it wasn't our responsibility to keep them connected to the father. They had a part to play in that, but I could be available. This is a healthy church that knows how to act outside of church, knows how to act inside church and knows how to handle everything in your hand. So let me give you this last thing. Everything that you touch should prosper. Everything that you touch should prosper. Let me give you one reference on in church because I think we can overlook some of these things in the New Testament. In Acts 18, 24 through 28, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move into number three, what you touch. In Acts 18, 24, a man named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was a Jew born in Alexandria, Egypt. He was a terrific speaker, eloquent, powerful in his preaching of the scriptures. He was well-educated in the way of the master and fiery in his enthusiasm. Apollos was accurate in everything he taught about Jesus up to a point, but he only went as far as the baptism of John. Well, that's not enough. Like we need the Holy Ghost. He preached with power in the meeting place, which is pretty phenomenal considering he didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But Priscilla and Aquila hurt him. Not Paul, not Peter, not one of the other apostles. Who are Priscilla and Aquila? They're bodybuilders in essence. That's what we call them at Choose Life, our volunteers, right? They were in the marketplace. They were business owners. But they took it upon themselves to help this guy, right? So they pulled him aside, it says, and told him the rest of the story. They didn't say, hey, you really need to talk to pastor. No, there comes a point, Hebrews 5.12 says that, where you need to be able to do some teaching. The pastor can't do all of it. The pastor can't do all the praying, all the preaching, all the planning, all the, the visionary aspects of the ministry and the advancement of that vision and disciple everybody. No, you need, uh, uh, you need to really stay, talk to Pastor Dean, they'll help you with that. You could help them with that in 20 minutes. But you haven't studied. You haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing. Aquila and Priscilla were not in the fivefold ministry, right? But they, they pulled this little whippersnapper aside and said, hey, listen, this is all good. But we need, we need to, you need to know the rest of this. And what happened? He went on to become a very influential leader. And they had a huge part in that, right? So lastly, like I said, we'll get back where I'd left off. First Peter three fifteen. quietly trust yourself to Christ, your Lord. And if anybody asks you why you believe as you do, be ready. Everyone say, be ready. be ready and do it in a gentle and a respectful way, but also do what is right. So when men speak against you, right, there needs to be sign following signs, following your faith. Okay. You can't turn your work life into an evangelism seminar. You have to do your work. Why? Because it says when they call you evil names, they will be ashamed of themselves. You know, I was talking to Laura and it was like longer ago, somebody had said something and I don't even know on what platform, you know, against Pastor Dean and we don't pay attention to any of that. You don't pay attention to the good or the bad because it's irrelevant. God's opinion of you is what stands. You don't entrust yourself to the opinions of men. But somebody had jumped on and said, uh, defending him, I know Pastor Dean, I know his reputation. So whatever you're saying is in, I, it, he didn't even have to be bothered by that. I didn't even have to be bothered by that. Nobody needs to be bothered by that. But, but that's what I'm saying. When people speak evil of you because you have a good reputation, 
right? So you have to do your work. You have to be effective in your studies. You have to be effective in your business. You have to be effective with your kids. So they'll become ashamed of themselves for falsely accusing you when you've only done what is good. So we have to be ready to speak up and tell anyone who's asking why you're living the way that you are. Keep a clear conscience before God. That's the message paraphrase of those same verses. So we have a responsibility outside of church, in the church, and with what's in our hands. And all of that is tied to our light and and hitting this bullseye, which is God's heart, that none be lost. We each have a part to play in that. We can pray for those outside circles. But I want to ask you today, like, what's your bullseye? What's your bullseye? Even as it pertains to this next Sunday, Easter Sunday, like, have you, like, maybe it's contacts in your phone. Maybe it's your neighbors. And if people already go to church, if people already get saved, that's fine. But know that for certain. Know that for certain. What would the Spirit of God direct you to do where you could make sure that you were intentional with your bullseye? And you could, because that's, that's what you're primarily responsible for. You know, I see an individual that, that came to this church. I was actually their youth pastor uh, when they were in high school and all of that. And, and so I, I had kept seeing them and kept seeing them. And, you know, and, and, and it wasn't really in a place where, obviously, I'm not the one that initiates conversation anyway. Um, but this definitely wasn't in a place where you would initiate conversation. You would um, bother people. And so I knew some of their family that went to church here. And I said, hey, hit them up. Tell them we'd love to have them. I know I keep seeing them. You know, we'd love to have them at church if they don't already have a church. And, and, and sometimes with your family, you kind of give up, you know, you've reached a certain point. And so, um, you know, and, and this individual had, she's like, you know, thank you for encouraging me to invite them. They're going to come, you know, for service on Easter Sunday. I don't have a lot of people in my bullseye. I, I spend a lot of time with Christians. A lot of my work is done with what's on, in my hand and then what's in the church. Like that's my, my primary, primary responsibility, although I do meet other people. But, but I'm just asking you to think and not just at Easter, but like all the time. Like what am I actually doing with my bullseye, with the people in my influence, right? With, with my church people, You can't just keep having birthday parties and celebrations with your family and the same people you've been known in the church forever. That's like a weird cult thing. We're not a weird cult thing. You made it that way. Get up out of here with that. We don't do that. Like who are the new people that you're including? Who are the new people that you're including? And then do you have a reputation of excellence, of, of, of being where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, of doing your work as unto the Lord? Because all of that affects your personal contacts. And we want to hit the bullseye. We don't want anybody to perish. His heart is our heart. Father, as we pray right now, we thank you for the revelation by the Holy Spirit, um, twofold, Father, uh, for our area, for our world of influence, that you would reveal to us our next steps in our neighborhood, with our family, with our contact list, with the people that we do have influence over, that we would be anointed and ready and willing to share and to move into people's lives in such a way that you would be glorified and they would not spend eternity separated from you or live a life uh, that was far less lower than what Jesus paid for. We invite you right now, Holy Spirit, to speak to us and we intercede on behalf of Hobbs, New Mexico, of West Texas, of the surrounding area of the Permian Basin, Father, those areas that you've entrusted to us right now. We just believe for laborers in the name of Jesus and we will be those laborers. Father, we know that the harvest is great, but there's a lot of work to do. So we build ourselves up on the assignment that we have, but then we also commission ministering spirits right now to go and and unlock the keys and bring in the people in the name of Jesus for those ministries and those that are watching online. Father, will cause us to be so energized and so inspired in our place and convicted in our place so that none would perish. None would perish. Father, we thank you for strategy, for keys, for relationships, healthy culture, healthy church in which we're teaching, we're leading, we're helping, we're holding up the arms of our pastors and those pastors that are online so that churches can continue to move forward because we're making connections. We're focused where we need to be focused on your heart in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that we would speak as uh, with all boldness as the oracles of God. 
We pray for spiritual leaders. We pray for our church partners that they speak with all boldness as the oracles of God. That everywhere they go, there is a light, there is a presence. People see the light. They see your presence. They see your goodness, Father. And there are signs and wonders and miracles that follow your presence and in, in, in your presence in the lives of the people. So, le Brasil, le Namande, le Brosel, le Namasi, oh, we thank you for strategy. We thank you for next steps. Next steps in reaching our family. Next steps in reaching our neighborhood. Next steps in reaching our city. Next steps in reaching our nation. Father God, we pray today for the United States House of Representatives, the House Leader Mike Johnson. Father, we pray right now for those leaders in the Great South. Father, we pray right now for Sarah Huckabee in Arkansas, John Bell Edwards in Louisiana, Tate Reeves in Mississippi, Kay Ivey in Alabama, Brian Kemp in Georgia, Ron DeSantis in Florida, Henry McMaster in South Carolina, Roy Cooper in North Carolina, Bill Lee in Tennessee, and Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. Father, we pray right now that the eyes of their understanding would be in light. Father, send forth laborers into the fields um, that are white to harvest, Father, as it pertains to their salvation. Father, we take authority over every demonic, every greedy, every perverted agenda, every dark agenda that would be perpetuated against the American people through legislation in the House or in any of these states. Father, right now we say that Jesus is Lord over Arkansas. Jesus is Lord over Louisiana. Jesus is Lord over Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina. Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. Father, we believe for great revival in these states, revival breaking out on college campuses, strong young adults who are bold about their faith on college campuses. We believe, Father, for revivals in the state capitals of each one of these states in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that the church of the Lord Jesus is a mighty moving force, and it's moving forward with truth. It's moving forward with light. It's moving forward with love, and great power is being made available for the people, that there's joy in cities. There's joy in states. There's peace in states. There's peace in cities uh, as an outflow uh, uh, and an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Father, that the gates of hell do not prevail against the church and your church is alive and well in America. You're able to save by many or by few and one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight and on and on. So, Father, we take the heads of the thousand today. We take the heads of the tens of thousands today as it's represented by these states and we believe for strong churches, anointed pastors, multiple, multiplied provision, multiplied volunteers, multiplied buildings Father, for the revelation of next steps Father, for bold anointed evangelists that preach the uncompromised word of God, that your truth is marching on in America from the youngest believers in elementary schools to the oldest believers um, in church pews we believe right now that your church is, is great, that the glory of the latter reign is greater than the former in the name of Jesus, and that where sin abounds, grace so much more abounds. So we thank you, Father, for the grace in this hour, for the grace on your church in 2024. We thank you, Father, for the grace on your church in 2024, that we're anointed to face the circumstances and the situations and the challenges that exist and overcome and dominate, dominate. We thank Thank you, Father, for, for the church dominating in the Great South. So, in the name of the Lord, Father, we set our faith in agreement with these prayer requests that have come in from our church family, from those that are online. Father, when two on earth agree is touching any 
anything, it is done. So we say that it is done. It is done concerning these things. You are faithful. You delight in the prayers of the righteous father. You delight to give us the desires of our heart. You delight to perfect those things that concern us. We thank you, Father, that you're perfecting the things that concern the church in Arkansas. You're perfecting the things that concern the church of Louisiana. You're perfecting the things that concern the church of Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Florida and South Carolina. You're perfecting the things that concern the church of North Carolina and Tennessee and Virginia. All hidden things, exposed, revealed, and removed. Everything that would hurt, everything that would bind, everything that would deceive, everything that would obstruct the freedoms of these people. We take authority over it now and we say you must desist in your operations. We believe that there's complete upheaval in the camp of the wicked right now, that they're turning on each other, that whatever it is that they plan, it will not prevail. And we thank you for the supply of the Holy Ghost. Father, we rejoice. We call you faithful. We say that it is well with our soul. It is well with the church in Hobbs. It's well with the churches watching online. It is well with the church of America. It is well. It is well. It is well. He who sits in the heaven laughs. We thank you, Father, for a flow of peace, a flow of joy. Why? Because we win. We win. We thank you, Father, for divine strategy, for wisdom and insight. You've made us to overcome. You've made us to rule and reign. You've made us to go all the way in the plan, in the plan that you have for us in business, in the plan that you have for our family, in the plan that you have for us in marketplace. You've ordained for us to go all the way. So we won't come up short in any way. We won't come up short in any ministry, in any endeavor, in any plan, in any strategy, Father, in any accumulation of wealth and blessing. We won't come up short. We're going all the way and we bless you and we praise you in advance. We declare that it is finished. We surrender our will to your will. We surrender our will to your word. We're walking by faith and not by sight and we say that it is well. We're going to hit the bullseye. We're going to hit the bullseye. The lost will be won. We will see our churches built and done, completing down to the last detail what you have assigned. It is well. Hallelujah. It is well for us financially. It is well for us in our bodies. It is well for us in the vision. It is well for us in the church. The glorious church will not be stopped. The truth will move forward. Nothing succeeds against the church. So we take our place, Father, and we thank you for the grace to be the ambassadors, to be the salt and the light in this hour. And God, use our personalities. I thank you for divine strategy and creative ways in the lives and the hearts of pastors, in the lives and the hearts of congregants congregation members. God, it doesn't have to be one way. We don't all have to do it the same, but use our personality, use our gifts, use the things that we're good at to reach people, as many people as possible within our world of influence. We'll hit the bullseye and we'll be quick to give you all the glory and it will be said of us, surely the Lord is with them. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on. Can I get a better amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Time in his presence changes things. The first thing is your face. Amen. Hallelujah. There should be a lifting in you and then there'll be a flow. And then you just stay in that place and you'll hear, right? And even today and over the next few hours before Easter Sunday, I believe our churches will be full, right? I believe that you'll have the words to say and don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. We want to give you a chance um, before we leave today to sow seed. Um, If you would like to do that, obviously your harvest in life is completely tied to the seed that you sow. So you want to take advantage. You always want to sow where you want to go too. So you want your money to be in good ground. This is obviously good ground. And I'm not just saying that because um, pastors and Kathy are my parents. I'm saying that because it's true, right? And so we want, we want to give you opportunity if you're digital, um, it'll 
it'll be on the screen. You can sow that way. Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains, there is seed time and harvest. So you're not only laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven, but you're also insulating yourself against economic conditions or oppression here on earth. Again, I already said it. My success is not tied to America's success. I don't care if they blow that dollar up so big, it bursts like a big hot air balloon. I don't care. That's irrelevant to the plan and the purpose of God for me and what's already been established for me in redemption. He, what he made him poor. He made him who? Jesus poor so that I would be rich. And as I continue to give, I receive a supernatural harvest. God supernaturally partnered with me financially. So Father, we thank you right now for the gifts of your people, the tithes and the offerings. We thank you, Father, that you are not a man that you should lie, that whatever you've said, you will perform. And so we thank you, Father, that as people give today, that it is given back to them good measure, pressed down, shaken together. We thank you, Father, that they are very rich, that you're making their name great and you're causing them to be a very big blessing because Christ took on the curse on the cross so that we could walk in the blessing of Abraham. And we determined to do it today. We act on what we know is true in faith. We give and we thank you, Father, that we will reap exponentially a hundredfold. We receive for them. We believe for the maximum harvest on the seed sown in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I love you guys. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks for being with us in the room. We're going to have an incredible resurrection Easter hit the bullseye. Amen. Love you guys. God's will has always been a life of perfect ease. He saw in his heart exactly how creation should be. He then spoke what he saw and it became what we see. So man's only labor was to have faith and receive. As it pertains to mankind, he made it quite clear. They were built for eternity, never to fear. In his image, they were fashioned, both spirit and soul, giving all his personal resources to achieve that goal. Equipped with his mind, nothing was hidden. An abundant life, they were freely given. Health, prosperity, they had for the asking, with peace and joy from everlasting to everlasting. from the dead. It's time for the church to get strong again. Then all of heaven rejoices with us. When they saw him walk through the walls. They saw the holes in his hands and his feet. They saw the, 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 the hole in his side. You don't die for a lie. And the church are the only ones that can come down in 3D and hold back iniquity and take everything that the devil has stolen. Allow anything that's happening in this world around me to distract me, and because of it, everybody's going to know that something is happening to you. the Lord was upon me. The Spirit of God moved upon me. The voice of God spoke unto me and said, Come up, come up hither, son of man. And I went, as it were, up into the air and stood with him, the head of the church, even the Lord Jesus Christ, in the air. And as I looked down upon the ground, I could see as a mouth laid out before me the entire nation, all of the states of the continental United States. And as I looked, he said, Behold, son, and I shall show you that which shall come to pass, and that which the eyes of many shall see, and they shall remember that their ears heard, that it shall come to pass. For there came a dark hand.
up out of the ocean from the east, even the Atlantic Ocean. It came up out of the sea as a hand. And as it rose up into the air, it became a dark cloud. And it filled the whole atmosphere. And yet it swept in the black like star. And he spake unto me and said, Son, that is the darkness of atheistic communism that is sweeping across the nation. Even in the minds of men in high places and politicians with great power. And this nation shall not grow more strong, and ye shall never have more liberty than ye have now. But liberties that you've known shall be seized and shall be taken from you. And I looked again, and I could see upon the mouth of the rock as though a bottle of ink had been spilled and it spread out over several states in the south and east. And then I looked and I could see spots blocked all over the mouth. And I said, Lord, what need is this? And he said, communistic inspired hatred among races shall cause greater turmoil than your nation has seen here before. Yeah, it is not the will of God, but men's hearts are perverse. They walk without the love of God and seek to have their own way. And so it shall be worse than you have seen. And I said, oh Lord, oh Lord, is there a remedy? Is there a remedy? What shall the answer be? And he said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceived and being deceived. Then I said, oh, Lord, do we have nothing to look forward to in the future except the darkness, the blackness, war, destruction, evil? Then he says, son of man, forget not your text, for you look at the things not seen. And so then I looked into the spirit realm. And I saw falling upon that mountain a ball of fire from heaven. The closer to the earth, the bigger it got. And then when it came to the earth, it divided into small balls or sparks of fire. It fell upon men. And I saw an army of men rise up. And it seemed as though their hands were fire. And they sat upon their heads a tongue of fire. And I said, what need of this? And he said, before the worst shall come, the day of darkness shall come, there shall rose the fullness of my truth, go who shall carry and the fire. Not only to the states of this nation, but to many other places. For there is a work that must be done first spiritually before the Lord shall come. Now prepare ye your hearts, for the time is at hand, and the beginning is now. And ye shall see, and ye shall know, for the hand of the Lord is upon you, and many of them to be used in these last days, and the work shall progress. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. This is the time, this is the hour, this is the place.